welcome to episode 62, I think, of Pulp Today. Seems like a lot of episodes. I'm drinking coffee because uh, today's topic, it might be in a little poor taste uh, for me to be uh, gulping down straight vodka while talking about Charles Jackson's kind of glare on the cover there. Charles Jackson's uh, famous groundbreaking book, The Lost Weekend. Um, Famous for being made into a movie, of course, that won Best Picture, directed by Billy Wilder, starring Ray Milland. Uh, Not to make too much of the social impact of the movie in the book, the book hits a great deal harder than the movie, but it probably helped to change the perspective on drinking and alcoholism in the mind of the American public. It suggested... And this was a novel thing to suggest at the time, that maybe the drunk had a medical problem, had a problem with addiction, rather than just being a loser who couldn't handle it. Uh, Books from 1944. I have an edition from 1963, which has a preface, an introduction by uh, the director of the Rutgers University Center of Alcohol Studies. As an aside, one thing that I love about old books is that when you buy old books in used bookstores, you find fascinating artifacts of other lives. Uh, Whoever bought this paperback in 1963 was a member of uh, Local 194 Retail Wholesale and Department Store Union. And on 6-2-1963, Peter McDermott uh, owned made $343. I hope that's not $3.43. And uh, $12 was deducted for his old age benefit. It could be that it was $3.43. And 12 cents was direct deducted. 1963. Uh, Also in here, and this was not in the book at the time that it was published, but I'm at the time that it was discovered, by me, but I'm sure uh, it's something that I found in my father's papers and decided to stick in here. There is a telegram from the author Charles uh, Jackson to my father asking him to telephone and uh, for heaven's sake, why didn't you include your telephone number and all that information you sent me about yourself? Uh, Note from my dad saying he never came for a visit. (laughs) Charles Jackson lived in New Brunswick the Rutgers connection, and we lived in East Brunswick, so I'm sure my father was initially pretty excited that uh, this other author who he admired lived nearby and they could they could hang out. But um, I want to read you a passage. Jackson does something better than, I mean famously better than anyone I've read before and since, which is capture the way the mind of a drunk works. Um, I mean, and not just a drunk, I shouldn't say that. This is familiar to me because I have certainly been a drinker and I have certainly been drunk and I know how your mind gets. And this is in particular a thing an author's mind will do to them while they're sitting at a bar, staring at themselves in a mirror, having a drink. Um, Backstory is he's... His brother and his girlfriend both tried to get him to go to an opera in the afternoon and he declined because he wasn't feeling quite himself but really what he wanted to do was just get plastered and not see anybody he knows and he uh, steals some money that's for the housekeeper and goes to a bar and rebuffs the uh, hostess because he wants to be alone and sits at the bar and drinks with the bartender Sam pouring them out and as he's looking in the mirror he remembers how often he used to look in the mirror when he was an adolescent and what he would see in himself there. And this is where it goes from there. He was moved and amused as he recalled that moment, a moment that had been repeated dozens and dozens of times in all his long adolescence. He picked up the glass and drank it to the bottom. A fancy came to him. Suppose the clear vision in the bathroom mirror could fade, as in some trick movie, and be replaced by this image over the bar. Suppose that lad, suppose time could be all mixed up so that the child of 20 years ago could look into the mirror 
the bathroom mirror and see himself reflected at 33 as he saw himself now. What would he think, that boy? Would he have accepted it? Is this what he dreamed of becoming? Would he accept it for a moment? In his emotion and embarrassment, he glanced away and signaled to Sam to pour him another. The men at the end of the bar had gone. Gloria sat up at a table in the back, filing her nails. He watched her, indifferent about her now. Then, fearing that she might see him looking and take it as an invitation to come forward again, he turned back to the bar, automatically picking up the new drink that had been set before him. Or wait, of course he would accept it. It was all crystal clear, like a revelation. Suddenly he was feeling brighter, more alert, and clear mentally than he ever had in his life. That kid, could he have seen this face, the man of today? Certainly he would have accepted it. He would have loved it. The idol of the boy had been Poe and Keats, Byron, Dawson, Chatterton, all the gifted and miserable and reckless men who had burned themselves out in tragic brilliance early and with finality. Not for him, the normal happy genius living to a ripe old age. Genius indeed. How could a genius be happy, normal, above all, long-lived, acclaimed by all or acclaimed in his lifetime, enjoying honor, love, obedience, troops, or friends? I must not look to have. The romantic boy would have been satisfied. He would have responded with all his ardent, youthful soul. There was a poetic justice in these delusioned eyes, disillusioned eyes, and the boy would have known it and nodded in happy recognition. In the next instant came disgust, self-disgust and scorn, self-reproach for inflating the image of himself out of all proportion to the miserable truth. And in the very next, the brilliant idea, oh, brilliant, as it swept over him and took possession of his excited brain, so feverishly alert that it seemed his perception could, at this moment, grasp any problem in the world. He fidgeted in suspense, shifted from one foot to the other, made an effort to calm himself. Now, wait a moment. Just let me order another drink and think this out slowly. It's coming too fast. A story of that boy and this man, a long, short story, a classic of form and content, a death in Venice, artistically only, not in any other way. The title in a glass. What else could it be? The glass of the title, meaning at first the whiskey glass he was drinking from, out of which grew the multitude of fancies, then the idea blurring and merging gradually, subtly, with the glass of the mirror, till finally the title comes to mean the reader's mind only, the glass over the bar through which the protagonist looks back in his youth, in a glass. It would begin with a man standing in a Second Avenue bar on just such an October afternoon as this, just such a man as he, drinking a glass of whiskey, several glasses, and looking at his reflection in the mirror over the bar. Thoughts poured in a rush. Details, incidents, names, ideas, ideas. At this moment, if he were able to write fast enough, he could set it down in all its final perfection, write down without a change or correction needed later, from the brilliant opening to the last brilliant, beautiful note of wise and grave irony. The things between the things, the wrench, the lost lonely abandonment when his father left home and left him, but anything, practically anything out of childhood, climaxed by the poetry writing and the episode of the bathroom mirror, then on to Dorothy, the fraternity nightmare, Dorothy again, leaving home, the village, prohibition, Mrs. Scott, the Rochambeau, the Bremen, Lafayette, Champlain, Degrassi, the TB years in Davos, the long affair with Anna, the drinking, Juan Lapins, the weekend there that lasted two months, the hundred dollars a day, the pawn shops, the drinking, the unaccountable things you did, the people got mixed up with, the summer in Provincetown, the winter on the farm, the books begun and dropped, the unfinished short stories, the drinking, the drinking, the drinking, the foolish psychiatrist, the foolish, foolish psychiatrist, down to Helen, the good Helen he knew would always, he always knew he would marry and now knew he would never marry. Helen, who was always right, who would sit through Tristan this afternoon resisting it, refusing to be carried away or taken in, seeing it or hearing it straight off for what it was, as he would only be able to see it and hear it after several years of irrational idolatry first. Whole sentences sprang to his mind in dazzling secession, perfectly formed, ready to be put down. Where was a pencil, paper? He downed his drink. The time four o'clock. Mrs. Foley would be there now, but to hell with that. This was more important. But caution, slow. Good thing there was no paper handy, no chance to begin impulsively what later must be composed. When? Tonight? Maybe. Certainly tomorrow, with all the calm and wise control needed for such an undertaking. A tour de force? 
critics would call it that, they'd be bound to. But what the hell was the matter with a tour de force, for Christ's sake, that the term should have come to be a sneer? Didn't it need a brilliant performance? And is brilliant something to snoot at? His mind raced on. But how about as through a glass darkly, or through a glass darkly? No, it had been done to death. Trite. Every lady writer in the land had used it at one time or another. If they hadn't, it, had a, it was a wonder. In a glass was perfect. He saw stacks of copies in bookshop windows piled in tricky pyramids. He would drop in and address the bookseller with some prepared witticism like, I appreciate the compliment you pay my book by piling it up in the window like a staple that should be in every home, but couldn't you add a card saying, send in ten wrappers and get a free illustrated life of the author? Hell, that was too long for wit. He'd have to cut it down. He glanced over people's shoulders in the subway and smiled to himself as he heard one girl say to another, I can't make head or tails of this. She had something if she meant tail. He read with amusement an embarrassed letter from his mother regretting the fact that he hadn't published a book she could show the neighbors, and why didn't he write something that had human interest? With a careful glance about him, he picked up his glass, offered a silent, rueful toast to human interest, and drank. Suddenly, sickeningly, the whole thing was so much eyewash. How could he have been seduced, fooled, into dreaming up such a ridiculous piece and perpetrating, even in his imagination, something so pat, so contrived, so cheap, so phony, so adolescent, so, crowning offense, sentimental? Euphoria, faithless muse, what crimes are committed in thy, mm, there was a line he might use, oh, and another, the ending, the ending sprang to his mind clear and true if he had seen it in print, the hero, after the long procession of motley scenes from his past life, would the line stretch out to the crack of doom? The hero decides to walk out of the bar and somewhere, somehow, that very day, not for himself, of course, for Helen, commit suicide. The tag, it would give her a lifelong romance. Perfect. But now, oh, more perfect still was the line that came next, the new ending, the little simple line set in a paragraph all by itself beneath the other on the last page. But he knew he wouldn't. How much it said, that line. How much it told about himself. How it disarmed the reader about the hero and still more the author, as if the author had stepped in between the page and the reader and said, You see, I didn't die. After all, I went home and wrote down what you've just been reading. And Helen, what of her? Did we marry, you ask? Shrug. Who can tell? Sam, I'll have one more rye. I mean, if you've ever been a drunk writer, that is all very, very painful to read. Um, of course, that entire segment is also a house of mirrors, because The Lost Weekend, in spite of the fact that for a while he pretended otherwise, was deeply autobiographical, and Jackson st struggled with uh, addiction his entire life. He eschewed Alcoholics Anonymous for a while. He thought that only the drunk could get himself clean, but eventually he he did decide that he needed help, and he lectured, and he lectured to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous all over the country, and uh, he did eventually commit suicide with barbiturates, but at a quite advanced age. Um, it's a it's a masterful book, and. Obviously, there's echoes of it in what William Burroughs would later write about uh, junk because it is it is that house of mirrors. It is that hall of mirrors. It is a man writing about writing about what he's going through. And he did write about what he's going All of those examples, all of those uh, scenes and ideas that come out in a rush the, he did go to Davos and uh, recover from tuberculosis there. He did. There was an incident when he was in a fraternity in college. Um, maybe the names have been changed, but it was all very real to him. And uh, as I said, he, he initially resisted the idea that he had written an autobiography, and certainly all of the names are different. Charles Jackson becomes Don Burnham. But it's all too frighteningly real not to be something that the author had experienced himself and uh, I couldn't re recommend it more highly it's as harrowing as the subject matter is as you can tell it is a it is so ferociously well written uh, that it, it it deserves your attention and even 
what is it, 60, 70, 80 years later now, 78 years later, it's an astonishing portrait of what goes on in the mind of someone destroying themselves with alcohol. Not the prettiest subject for today, uh, but one to think about and a book to recommend. Enjoy and uh, have one on me.